Despite his days of utterly dominating the internet having passed, I think it's safe to say that Toby Fox's Undertale is just one of those games that needs no introduction. Of course, I'm gonna give you one anyway. Having been released on September 15th, 2015 on Steam with console ports coming in the following years, the critically acclaimed indie RPG Undertale was made almost entirely by one person, that being Toby Fox, with character designs and artwork being done by Tammy Chang. Undertale takes inspiration from a multitude of different sources, including fellow RPGs like the Mario and Luigi series and the Mother series, as well as other games like those from the Tauho project. Undertale has received mounds of praise in regards to his characters, writing, combat system, and the unique way it tackles RPGs and video games as a whole. In Undertale, you play as a human child who has fallen into the underground, which is a place inhabited by the monsters. The monsters are a race that previously coexisted with humanity, but after a brutal war were banished deep beneath the earth, and are kept separated from the surface world by a magical barrier. On your journey back to the surface, the human child will meet a wide variety of monsters, many of which will try and stop them. And while in many other games you just kill them and be done with it, Undertale is a game in which, to quote the trailer, nobody has to die. As such, you are given the choice to use various act commands on the monsters you encounter which will allow you to spare them. Of course, it's a game where nobody has to die, not a game where nobody can die. So while you can spare every enemy you come across, there really isn't anything stopping you from, oh, I don't know. Snuffing out the life of every living being you come across, leaving nothing but broken dreams, crushed hopes, and piles of dust in the rain. Of course, whether there's a loss of life or not, a fight is still a fight, and today I intend to rank the difficulty of the fights of the toughest opponents the underground has to offer. But before we begin, I would like to clarify that every boss is being ranked under showing in the pacifist route, where you're level 1 and the way to win the fight is to spare them. For obvious reasons, this rule does not apply to bosses that are exclusive to certain routes. And while I'm mostly defining what is considered a boss based off what the wiki says, I am I am adding a stipulation that the boss has to at least attack you to be on this ranking. As well, remember, this is just my opinion, so if you have to leave a comment telling me why I'm wrong, make sure I can actually read it and not just take a shit on your keyboard. But without further ado, let's begin my ranking of the Undertale bosses from easiest to hardest with... Number 26, Mr. Stop Watching This Video If You Haven't Played Through The Game's Pacifist Route And Don't Want To Be Spoiled About His Final Boss. Yeah, the game's been out for like 7 to 8 years, and most of the twists in the game are already well known, especially considering you're likely a fan of Undertale if you chose to click on this video. But considering he's the first boss I talk about on this ranking, I decided to add a spoiler warning. But with that out of the way, let's really start now with number 26, Asriel Dreamer the absolute god of hyper death. Yeah, not exactly the title you'd expect for a boss at the bottom of the ranking, huh? Usually, this is the point where I start talking about how the boss's attacks are easy to dodge, and how even if you do get hit, you don't take a lot of damage. But in this case, the opposite is actually true. Azrael's attacks are actually among the harder to dodge in the game, either due to quick hitboxes with moves such as Chaos Saber and Shocker Breaker, or because of the amount of area they cover with moves such as Star Blazing and his phase to Comet Attack, and he ain't lacking in damage either, as all of his attacks do a base damage of 6, meaning you're most likely only gonna be able to take 4 hits before going down. So why does Azrael Dreamer rank so low on this ranking? Oh, nothing much really, just the teensy weensy little itty bitty practically microscopic fact that you can't die. Yeah, your HP can reach zero and your soul can break, but if it does, it'll just put itself right back together and you're right back in the fight. The only punishment you get for dying is that you have to survive three consecutive turns before Azrael starts progressing his dialogue again. In phase one, one, there are two acts you can use, one which increases your defense and another which fills your inventory of healing items. And in phase two, you have to contend with the attacks and soul modes used by the previous bosses, which shouldn't be too much trouble considering
considering you've beaten them before, but even if it was, you still can't die. In fact, this whole section could have probably just been me saying, you can't die in this fight, and that would have been justification enough to put him here. So why didn't I just make that the entire segment and be done with it? Well, Hopes and Dreams is a really good song, and I wanted to have it play for longer. Number 25, Toriel. The former queen of the monsters gets a higher ranking than her late son for one reason and one reason alone. That being that you can actually die in this fight. Not that it's particularly easy to do so. In fact, when you're at low health, the fireballs Toriel attacks you with will start to move away from you. So in order to lose this fight, you actually have to try to die. To win this fight, you have to spare Toriel 24 times. Though, the fight is effectively one out of the 12 spares since she stops attacking at that point. Which, if I'm being honest, is kinda lame. What I mean by that is when sparing enemies, you're supposed to figure out which axe to use, sometimes even in which order, in order to make them sparable, making every pacifist encounter something of a puzzle. Both Toriel and a few other bosses in the game, you just hit spare until they give up. Toriel's boss fight is still good in my opinion due to the emotional impact, especially the first time around, but the fact that you win just by hitting spare 24 times comes off as a bit uncreative to me. But anyway, that's the end of my little tangent. Engine. Just something I wanted to talk about. Number 24, Snowdrake's Mother. You know, I think out of all the amalgamates, Snowdrake's Mother may have just gotten the worst of it. And considering what the other ones look like, yeah, that is saying something. I mean, at least all the other amalgamates got some cool fighting abilities, but Snowdrake's Mother? None of her attacks even cross the soul's starting position, so you don't even have to move. In fact, some of her attacks don't even appear inside the battle box, so you couldn't get hit even if you wanted to. Bearing Snowdrake's mother is just as easy as dodging her attacks. All you have to do is use the joke act three times and then spare her to win. Snowdrake's mother may be the easiest of the amalgamate fights, but if this were a ranking on the bosses based on how unsettling their encounters are, Snowdrake's mother might have a good argument for being number one. I mean, it certainly gave me chills. Number 23, Doggo. He has one attack, and it only hurts you when you move. The only reason he ranks this high is that one, you can die in this fight. Two, his attacks don't actively try and avoid you. And three, he doesn't have any attacks where you just can't get hit. A real high bar for the competition this time, huh? Number 22, Lesser Dog. There are two ways to approach the fight with Lesser Dog. You can be a coward and pet him once and then just spare him, or you can pet him again and again and take him where no dog has gone before. Houston. What the dog doing? Up until, like, 55 pets, where the game just has enough of your shenanigans. Lesser Dog has two attacks that are both easy to dodge. One of them is a dog that leaps at you, and the other is two spear attacks, one blue and one white. Why he uses a spear attack when he carries a sword, I do not understand. But then again, I don't think man was built to understand the greatness of Lesser Dog. But whether you pet him one or 100 times doesn't change the fact that Lesser Dog is easy easy. Number 21, Shiren. Shiren is actually quite similar to Lesser Dog in that you only have to use one act and then spare to end the fight, but if you wanted to, you can keep using acts to get some funny dialogue. You can even use the Hum Act five times to make a late game enemy encounter easier, which I think is pretty neat. Anyway, what you have to do to win this fight is use the Hum Act to encourage Shiren to sing her song. Why you're doing this when her song is apparently so bad that it can actually physically hurt you, I don't know. But anyway, all you have to do after humming once is spare her and the fight is over. I'd say Shiren and Lesser Dog are pretty interchangeable on this ranking, but I put Shiren higher because her music notes are a bit harder to dodge than any of Lesser Dog's attacks.
Number 20, Greater Dog. You remember during the Toriel segment where I talked about how I didn't like how a few bosses in the game boiled down to just spare them until they give up? Lesser Dog's bigger, stronger, but certainly not meaner counterpart is a great example of what I want to see from the bosses in Undertale, at least concerning the Act Command. You see, what you first have to do is get Greater Dog closer to you by either using Beckon or Ignore, and then you pet it. After which, you use the play act and then pet it again twice, after which Greater Dog becomes sparable. Yeah, maybe it's not perfect, but it's definitely better than just pressing spare again and again and again. Also worth mentioning is that using the ignore act four times will cause the battle to end, and you can also cause the battle to end early by using the stick. This applies to every dog boss, by the way. As for Greater Dog's attacks, he has two. One is a spear attack that periodically turns blue, and the other is a dog dog that barks at you. This attack was actually the reason why Greater Dog was initially a bit higher on this list, as I actually found it quite hard to avoid due to the battle box being cramped and the barks coming out really quickly. But as it turns out, if you just don't move, this good boy's nap will go undisturbed. It was because of this discovery that I moved him a few spots down. Number 19, Doggy, Doggy, Doggy. Number 19, Dog Amy and Dog Aressa. Oh, what a cute couple. They look so happy together. Wouldn't it just be a shame if I... Why are we still here? Just to suffer? This pair of canine newlyweds has two attacks, one for each dog. The first of which involves a ring of hearts. Ring of Hearts, where have I seen that before? Uh oh. Oh, oh no! Oh no! Luckily, unlike the attack from everybody's favorite jester, this Ring of Hearts is very easy to dodge. The ring is made up of eight projectiles, four of which will only hurt you if you're moving. As such, all you have to do is stop in front of blue bullets and let them pass through you to get inside the ring and do the same thing to get out, and repeat until the attack ends. Their second attack, which involves axes bouncing across the bottom of the battle board until they form a heart, isn't any harder to dodge. What you want to do is stay at the bottom of the battle board and move under the axe when it bounces up. That is, unless you enjoy getting cleaved in half by a giant axe. And, uh, you know, I'm not one to judge others for their personal choices, but I can't exactly say that that's conducive to a long and healthy life. The reason the dogs are attacking you is because you smell like, well, a human. So to make them sparable, what you should be doing is around at the speed of an ordinary human in the snow in order to mask your scent. Then you let them sniff you again, and then pet the both of them, at which point they become sparable. You know, when I first started making this part of the video, I suffered from a serious lack of ideas of how to make this segment entertaining. But once I was finished with it, this segment probably ended up having the highest density of jokes and edits out of any segment in the video. Funny how that works, isn't it? Number 18, Nabstabluke. Now, I ain't afraid of no ghost, but even if I was, I don't think I'd be scared of Nabstabluke. Though, to be fair to good old Bluke, he's not exactly like he's trying to be frightening, so I think we can leave our proton packs at the door. Nabstabluke has three attacks, the first of which involve tears falling down until they hit the bottom of the battle board, at which point they will then climb up the sides of the battle board to drop on the soul. I actually find this attack to be pretty hard to dodge, considering how little space you're given to move around. You really have to time your movements well in order to avoid this attack. As for Napsabluke's other attacks, he has one where he just cries, and another where he literally doesn't do anything. In order to spare Napsabluke, you have to use the cheer act three times, at which point he shows you his dapper bloop trick. After which, what you have to do is use the cheer act again, or use flirt if you're feeling extra saucy, and the battle ends there. You know, with a demeanor like Blukey's, I just think he'd be the perfect person to pilot a giant robot that's not really a robot in order to fight giant monsters that want to turn all humanity into orange juice. 
Number 17 and Dogane. So has anyone ever taken a panorama photo of their dog? Cause yeah, that's basically endogony in a nutshell. But anyway, the way to spare this Lovecraftian good boy is exactly the same as greater dog. That being beckoning, petting, playing, and then petting twice. The only difference between their sparing methods is that ignore is useless. As if you try to do it, endogony will just appear everywhere you look. Which is something normal dogs already do. You ain't special, Endogony. Endogony has two attacks. The first of which is a rog that- F Fuck it. A, a rog? You know what? That's probably funnier than any Joker reference I could think of. I'm keeping it in. The first of which is a dog that turns into a rocket that will attempt to damage you by ramming into you. Luckily, despite having the power of jet propulsion, this dog moves no faster than a brisk stroll, with long pauses in between movements, giving you more than enough time to dodge out of the way. Its other attack is to downvote you on Reddit, or perhaps it'd be more accurate to say sidevote. But bullets are easy enough to dodge, but Endogony does shoot a lot of them, so it is possible to slip up and get hit. It's also worth mentioning that endogony can be made immediately sparable by using the stick, or by using the hush puppy, which is obtainable by giving a hot dog to the dog in the Metaton Resort. Whether you use these items or not, however, endogony remains one of Undertale's easier bosses. Number 16, Royal Guards. I originally had the Royal Guards like two spots higher, and I have absolutely no idea why. I mean, yeah, sure, the battle board is pretty cramped when they attack, and the projectiles don't really give you a lot of room to move, but it's not like their attacks are impossible to dodge, and if you're good enough, you can end the fight in just two turns. The Royal Guards have two attacks, the first of which involves these pineapples that move diagonally either up or down, bouncing off the sides of the battle board. This attack is pretty easy to dodge, especially compared to their second attack, which involves stars moving from the top and bottom of the screen in a straight line. This attack spawns a lot of stars, which makes it very easy to get hit due to how little room you have to maneuver through them. In order to spare the Royal Guards, what you first have to do is use the Clean Act on Royal Guard 02. This will make them use a version of a star attack that I'm like 99% sure has less stars in it, as well as a green projectile. What you have to do to progress the fight is touch this green projectile five times in order to wipe the cooling dirt off O2's armor. And considering we're basically fighting in a volcano, this predictably causes him to overheat. To combat this, he takes off his chest plate, which causes Royal Guard 01 to become so hot and bothered that he, quite literally, can't think straight. At this point, the attacks that come from the top of the screen will move off the battle board and become easier to dodge. What you need to do now is use the Whisper Act on Royal Guard 01 so that at the end of a turn he confesses his feelings to O2, at which point they become sparable. If you're good enough, you can hit the green projectile five times in a single turn, but if you don't, it's not like it's the end of the world. All you have to do is use the Clean Act again and you're right back where you left off. And as I said, the stars seem to be toned down when you use the Clean Act, so the projectiles are pretty easy to dodge. Why did I have these guys two spots higher again? Number 15, Mad Dummy. Ho, mukatte kuru no ka? Nigezuni kono Dio ni chikazuite kuru no ka? Chikazukana kya? Teme o buchi no mese nai inde na. Ho ho. Here's the thing about being a pacifist, it means you can't attack your enemy. Of course, it's fine if they attack themselves though, and if your enemy just so happens to accidentally shoot themselves in the face because you turned their gun around, that's totally fair game. With that in mind, I'd like you to meet Mad Dummy. Mad Dummy is not affected by physical attacks because he's a ghost possessing the dummy. If you try and hurt him, he can just put himself back together. Why this matters so much in a pacifist route, 
I don't know, but whatever. Because Mad Dummy is immune to physical attacks, you have to make his attacks hit him instead of you. Mad Dummy's main way of attacking you in the first phase is for use of his dummy minions. These guys will show up, shoot a projectile at you, and then leave. Doesn't sound that impressive, but as anyone who's ever been to a Flat Earth convention can tell you, dummies travel in herds. But dummy minions will shoot clusters of bullets at you, but they're pretty easy to dodge. The main difficulty comes from getting them to hit the Mad Dummy, especially later in the phase when he starts moving around all over the place. The best time to try and get hits in is when he stops moving at the end of his attacks. Some attacks will also incorporate a row of dummies that will move across the battle board with a gap in their formation. These attacks are pretty easy to dodge. Something I've noticed during this fight is that in attacks involving the row of dummies, the dummy minions will only ever show up after the row is finished with their attack. So you won't be having to deal with both attacks at the same time. Once Mad Dummy gets hit enough times, he will fire his dummy minions and replace them with robots. And let me tell you, these guys are packing heat. Enemy spotted. Magic missiles shot by the dummy bots are harder to dodge than the normal dummy minion projectiles because while they have that red circle on them, they will home in on the soul. Though they still aren't too troublesome to avoid outside of the final attack which combines the row of dummies and the magic missiles. You can also make the magic missiles hit Mad Dummy, but since the fight progresses no matter what you do at this point, the only purpose in doing this is your own amusement. After the final attack, Mad Dummy decides to do away with friends and throw a knife at you. He then promptly runs out of knives. While Mad Dummy gets an edge over the bosses below it due to the length of the fight, it's still pretty easy. Number 14, Reaper Bird. What is that? What is that? What is it? Oh, no, butterflies. Butterflies. Because the Reaper Bird is a combination of Final Froggit, Whimsalot, and Astigmatism, what you have to do to make it sparable is to mystify, pray, and pick on it in any order. Clean is also an available act to use, but it does nothing. While making it sparable is easy enough, it's Reaper Bird's attacks which are the reason why it ranks higher than the other bosses below it. The Reaper Bird has two attacks, both of which are assisted by the Everyman. This guy. The first of which involves the everyman approaching you while butterflies fly out from where his head should be. And the second involves him repeatedly shooting his head as a projectile which homes in on you. Both of these attacks are hard to dodge because they cover a lot of area and give little room for moving out of the way. However, you won't have to deal with these attacks for long because, as I said earlier, all you have to do to placate the reaper bird is to mystify, pray, and pick on it in any order. This combined with the fact that the reaper bird has has a unique bird attack that he will use at the start of every battle, which you can only get hit by if you intentionally run to the butterflies, considerably lowers this fight's difficulty. Despite that, however, it is around this point in the list where the bosses, while still easy, have a noticeable increase in difficulty. Number 13, Memory Head. Oh look, another one of the amalgamates. Don't worry, it's cool, I didn't want to sleep tonight anyway. Unlike his horrifying brethren, Memory Head only has one attack. However, this attack is actually pretty hard to dodge, which is why it gets higher billing than the bosses lower on this list. This attack consists of dots appearing on the screen that then expand into strangely familiar faces. Eh, it's probably nothing. The reason I found this attack hard to dodge is not only because the faces are pretty big, but the placement of the dots is completely random. That, coupled with the speed at which the dots appear, can make this attack a nightmare to avoid. Luckily, you won't have to deal with it for long, as the way to spare Memory Head is quite easy. All you have to do is use the Cell Act, and then refuse their offer to join them, after which they become sparable. You know, these guys give up pretty easy for beings that came to be through injections of pure determination. Number 12, Lemon Bread. This is where I put it. Successful experiment with determination. If I had one. 
Out of all the amalgamate fights, it was lemon bread who I found to be the hardest. The method for making lemon bread sparable is similar to the one used in the Reaper Bird fight, where you use three different acts in any order. However, the acts you have to use here are unhug, flex, and hum. But the method used to make lemon bread sparable is not the reason it ranks so high. No, that's because of his attacks, of which it has two. Lemon bread's first attack is to make the battle board grow teeth and- was that the bite of 87? To dodge this attack, you have to move to the gap in the teeth. And if you don't move immediately after the attack ends, you're gonna get hit by a tooth growing in, so be quick. His second attack involves it shooting flashing orbs at the soul, as well as spawning in teeth to limit your movement. If you time it right, you can leave the mouth without getting hit, but other than that, I really don't have any tips for dodging this attack. While Lemon Bread's attacks can be difficult to dodge, his sparing method being so easy does hamper his difficulty quite a bit. Though it is more difficult the first time you fight it when you don't know the axe you need to use in order to make it sparable. And while Reaper Bird only had one act out of four that didn't do anything, Lemon Bread has six different act options with only the three I mentioned earlier getting you closer to being able to spare it. However, you are able to figure out which axe to use by looking at Lemon Bread's design and figuring out which monsters it's made up of, and then using the axe you used in those fights to make those monsters sparable. However, even without prior knowledge of which axe to use, Lemon Bread is nothing impossible. Number 11, Undyne. The Dreamers notwithstanding, the Captain of the Royal Guard is the first on this ranking to not be considered a mini-boss. As well, she's, technically, the first boss on this ranking to use a different soul mode during her fight. With one swipe of her spear, Undyne is able to turn you green and environmentally friendly, rendering your carbon emissions to zero by leaving you unable to move. Your only defense during this phase is a 100% eco-friendly shield that you have to move using the air keys in order to block the arrows coming your way. It kind of plays like Dance Dance Revolution, only instead of trying to dance, you're trying not to get impaled. The arrows start off blue, but when they turn red, that's your cue to move the shield to block it, which gives off just the most satisfying sound when you do. Instant hit of dopamine. Later in the fight, to mess you up, she will introduce yellow inverted arrows, which, when they get close enough, will move to the other side of the screen before closing in. Overall, I found the green soul mode to be not that difficult, even during my first time fighting her. If you want to make the fight more difficult, you can use the challenge act to make her arrows go faster. But even then, I didn't really have a lot of trouble. In order to progress the fight, what you have to do is wait for Undyne to turn the soul red again, at which point you get your ass in gear and skedaddle. Of course, Undyne will chase after you, and when she catches you, you'll be thrown back into the battle, at which point she turns the soul green again. You repeat the cycle until you reach Hotland, because, as it turns out, fish don't do well in volcanoes. Who knew? Considering we're on the pacifist route right now, what you should do is take the water from this conveniently placed water cooler and pour it on her, at which point she gets confused and leaves. Undyne has two spear attacks she uses during the red soul mode, but you're unlikely to see them since your first response to the soul being turned red should be to run away. You know, for how much buildup Undyne is given during the waterfall segment of the game, this fight is kind of underwhelming. Sure, she's more difficult than anything that came before on this ranking, but she's still pretty easy. I don't even remember really having any trouble with her the first time I fought her. You know, I think after stalking after you in Waterfall and observing your actions on the passing through, Undyne might just be holding back. If that is the case, then I wonder what Undyne would be like when she isn't pulling any punches. Oh well, guess we'll never know. Number 10, Glide. I don't even know. Even though Undertale's been out for like 7 to 8 years now, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if most people watching this video never even knew Glide existed till now. Which makes sense considering just how hard this guy is to encounter. You have to go to the mysterious door room in Snowden with the four mushrooms before fighting Papyrus and do nothing but move around for two whole minutes with absolutely no hints to do this in the game. 
That honestly sounds like a rumor you hear on the playground back in the old days of gaming. What are you gonna tell me next? If I beat all three routes without taking damage, I'll unlock Luigi? Hey, it's not like you've done it, so how can you say it's not real? But anyway, despite how obscure Glide is, which is quite ironic considering how much this guy loves attention, I actually find him to be one of the harder bosses in the game. Both of Glide's attacks involve pelting you with star-like projectiles, the first of which involves shooting waves of these bullets rapidly, and the second shoots three waves at a time accompanied by bigger exploding star bullets. As well, in his second attack, the next wave comes out before the first one is off screen. Both of these attacks, but especially the second one, are really hard to dodge because of just how much they limit your movement. And when these stars hit you, they hurt, dealing around six damage. The spare glide, you first have to applaud twice, followed up by doing nothing twice, and then either doing nothing again or booing him at which point he leaves to go find attention elsewhere. Because of how long it takes to spare Glide, you're gonna have to deal with these hard-to-dodge attacks for a while, making getting hit all the more likely. Despite how little this guy is talked about, Glide is definitely one of Undertale's harder bosses. Number 9, So Sorry. In order to find So Sorry, what you have to do is launch the game on October 10th, 8pm. Then you go to this room in Hotland and walk on the invisible bridge to reach the art club, at which point you interact with a sign and the encounter begins. The only hint you get is a sign advertising the art club in the Metaton Resort that's hidden behind a trick wall, and my statement about being able to unlock Luigi in this game grows ever more plausible. Anyway, So Sorry is different than the other bosses on this list since he's not actually trying to hurt you. He's just that clumsy. So sorry's first attack is Tail Whip, which lowers your defe- <laughs> It hurts you?! What? You can't even get that right?! Man, Undertale is the worst Pokemon game ever. When So Sorry uses his attack, his tail alternates from being blue and orange, which requires you to be moving when it hits you in order to avoid getting hurt. The tail swings pretty quickly, but the tail is long enough that you'll know what to do when it does. For his second attack, So Sorry accidentally throws crumpled up paper at you that piles up at the bottom of the battle board. If you touch this pile, you will take damage. This attack can be pretty tricky to dodge due to just how restricted your movement is, due to both the crumpled papers falling from above and the piled up paper at the bottom. Nearing the end of the fight, he will try to use his magic pencil to draw a picture, but accidentally summon two doodle bogs. I said doodle bog, not doodle bob. Now get out of here before Viacom decides to bring down the copyright hammer. These guys attack with projectiles that move in a circle, and they shoot it differently depending on whether both are active or not. But Doodlebox projectiles can also be pretty hard to dodge due to the way they move around and just how many will be on screen at once. You use the draw act to draw a boat to get rid of them. After you're done dealing with the Doodlebox, you have to dodge both of So Sorry's attacks at the same time. Meaning not only do you have to deal with the tail, but you have to deal with large crumpled up paper projectiles falling down on you in a small battle board that gives you very very little room to move. While this attack is really hard to dodge, So Sorry only uses it once, and once you're done, the battle is effectively over. I imagine the bosses ranked below are feeling pretty embarrassed right now considering So Sorry managed to rank above them when he isn't even trying to kill you and all the damage he does during this fight is com- Number 8, the Master of Puzzles, the Unparalleled Spaghettor, the Great Papyrus! Let me make something crystal clear right off the bat. Papyrus only ranks at number 9 because he's being nice. If Papyrus was actually trying during this fight, he wouldn't just rank number 1. Oh no, that's too easy for him. He would rank above it. Papyrus is without a doubt the biggest badass in the entirety of the underground. But what else could you expect from this Jape Levin spaghetti making world famous royal guardsman? Asterisk. Okay, all joking aside, on my first playthrough of Undertale, Papyrus did genuinely kick my ass. And I have a feeling that that was an experience shared by a lot of players, as Papyrus is the first enemy in the game that can turn the mechanics on their head and require you to adopt a completely different playstyle in order to beat him. At first, this fight seems like a complete joke, with you flying high over attacks that can't even reach you at the soul's starting position. And by the time he's using his fabled blue attack, which, by the way, the only thing you need to do to avoid it is not move, you start to think that Papyrus really is just full of hot air. And then he clips your wings. <laughs> 
Yep, you're blue now, Vass has attacked. And with this new paint job comes subjection to the laws of gravity, sending you careening down straight into the bone zone. In the blue soul mode, you're given the ability to jump, and by holding down the button for longer, you can jump higher. You're going to need this ability to dodge the variety of bone attacks that Papyrus throws at you during phase two, which include bones of varying sizes that sweep across the bottom and top of the battle board, bone waves, and bones that you have to jump through. Later in the fight, his attacks start to get more complex while incorporating bones that move up and down, and bone walls that periodically open and close. As well, in some attacks, Papyrus incorporates blue bones, which, like I've said, you avoid by not moving. In some of Papyrus's attacks, he tries to catch you off guard by making you think the attack has ended, but then throwing out a few more bones. But of course, all of this pales in comparison to his special attack. Or at least it probably would if it didn't get stolen by this dog. So with no other choice left, Papyrus uses a completely normal attack. And of course by that I mean an onslaught of bones ended by a field of bones followed up by a giant bone that in order to avoid you have to jump up so high it extends the battle board upwards. All of Papyrus' attacks can be pretty tricky to dodge even once you've gotten the hang of the blue soul mode. Considering Papyrus is the first real boss you fight in the game, him being actually pretty difficult is definitely quite a surprise, though certainly a welcome one as the Papyrus fight is an incredibly memorable moment in a game full of them. Number 7, Mad Mew Mew. The thing about the fight with Mad Mew Mew is that it's exclusive to the Nintendo Switch version of the game. Meanwhile, I'm playing the PC version. I have a feeling that for some future boss rankings, version exclusive bosses are gonna be the bane of my existence, but I lucked out on this one. And that's because of the Mad Mew Mew PC port by Dead Duck. Did somebody say PC port? What the fuck? Stay back, demons! Yeah, yeah, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one recreation, especially since this version of fight isn't broken up by turns, but for the purposes of this video, it works. If you're interested, I'll leave a link in the description. Anyway, after having kicked Mad Dummy's pawn-filled ass- Wait, does he have an ass? I don't know. They decided to become an anime cat girl. Mad Mew Mew's attacks are mainly made up of dropping white projectiles from the top of the screen, with her occasionally shooting projectiles from her staff. These attacks would be simple enough to dodge were it not for the fact that you're controlling two souls at once. During this fight, your soul is turned half red and half blue, and you have to move each half separately. If either half gets hit, you take damage. As well, the souls are only able to move to certain areas on the board. Later in the fight, the areas you can move to gets expanded and attacks start coming out horizontally as well. Some of the orbs will be half red or half blue, and in order to avoid damage, you have to move the corresponding soul color to it. Think Simon says, but with pain. Overall, I found Mad Mew Mew's attacks to be pretty hard to dodge since there's a lot of information to process, like where the white projectiles are, where the red ones are, where the blue ones are, where each half of your soul is located, and it only gets worse once she starts using horizontal attacks. Another reason that I ranked Mad Mew Mew so high is because of inexperience. I've played through Undertale a few different times at this point, but I've never been able to fight Mad Mew Mew before. And as such, I've never had to deal with her unique attacks and gimmicks. Something like controlling two souls at once is entirely new and not easy to learn. As such, I found Mad Mew Mew to be among one of the more difficult fights in Undertale. Number 6, Muffet. There is going to be an opening joke for this segment, but I sometimes show my parents these videos, and honestly, I couldn't think of anything that wouldn't make me look like a complete and total weirdo. So instead, I'm going to talk about how I recently played the two Insomniac developed Spider-Man games for the PlayStation. They are really good, especially considering how bad licensed games tend to be. If you're a Spider-Man fan, then I couldn't recommend playing these games enough. I might do a boss ranking, but I've already got enough on my plate right now, and I want to clear it out before I start making more promises. But anyway, back to Muffet. Despite being classified as a mini-boss, Muffet does use an alternate soul mode during her fight, that being the purple soul. How the purple soul works is that it restricts your movement to these purple lines on the battle board. 
Muffin has three main attacks, throwing spiders, throwing donuts, and throwing croissants. All three of which hurt much more than they really should. Well, for the croissants and donuts, you could argue that they're stale, but the spiders still make no sense. Yeah, sure, spiders are scary and they can bite you and whatever, but if a spider is thrown at you with enough force to really do anything, then Newton's third law is gonna come into play and that spider's likely gonna end up a lot more hurt than you. The spiders will move in a straight line, the donuts will bounce off the top and bottom of the battle board, and the croissants act as a boomerang. These projectiles move pretty quickly, especially the spiders later in the fight, and can be hard to dodge for that reason. These projectiles are especially hard to dodge when Muffet uses them together. Three times throughout the fight, Muffet will stick her pet at you, which attacks by trying to bite you. As well, it causes the strings to fall down, and to avoid getting hit, you have to climb up them while avoiding falling spiders. This attack is hard to dodge due to just how much the falling spiders restrict your movement. Because of how fast the strings fall, you have to move up fast, but you can't move up too fast or else you get hit by the spiders. But if you move up too slow, you fall into the jaws of death. <laughs> which apparently isn't where the hitbox is. As well, if the spider is directly above you, you'll have to move to the left or right, which is time that isn't being spent going up. As well, getting hit by Muffet's attacks her, as they do a base damage of 6, though you can pay her to lower the damage and even get a discount if you entertain her by struggling. Overall, while not the hardest boss in the game, there's a reason most players opt to skip this fight by using an item from the spider bake sale. Number 5, Metatoni X. Metaton starts out the fight in his invulnerable base form, and in order to progress the fight, you have to convince him to turn around so you can flip the switch on his back. After you do so, he has a seizure and then transcends into his ultimate form. Robot David Bowie. In order to combat Metaton EX's wide array of attacks, you're given the Yellow Soul Mode, which has the ability to fire bullets. And that's how you know the child Asgore got this soul from was American! Metaton EX's attacks include falling white boxes that you can shoot to break, falling metabots that will shoot a projectile at you if you don't shoot them first, white boxes that cannot be destroyed with bullets, falling arms that are the entire length of the battle box, and in order to make them attract, you have to shoot a move moving target, legs that will either start or stop moving when you shoot them, bombs, you, you want, want it, it's, it's yours, yours, my friend, as long as, long as you, you have, have enough, enough ink. To sign this here release form that states Metaton Entertainment LTD is not legally responsible for any injury sustained due to improper handling of these explosives. One definition of improper handling is shooting these bombs. Don't shoot at live explosives, idiot. Haven't you ever seen an action movie? Metaton also uses a laser projecting disco ball that shoots blue and white lasers. During this attack, you can shoot the disco ball to change the colors of the lasers. Metaton is even capable of rewinding time in order to try and hit you with attacks you already dodged. At certain points in the fight, Metaton will let loose his heart and it attacks you with electric bolts. Different versions of this attack will also combine it with different weapons from Metaton's arsenal, such as falling metabots, a rotating shield of boxes, and a shield of two rotating bombs along with legs that attack you from the side. Shooting at the heart during this attack will end it early, and it doesn't count as fighting Metaton. I'm gonna assume this was for game balance reasons, because while I've never taken out someone's heart, pumped it full of lead, and then put it back in, I'm gonna assume they wouldn't exactly be fine afterwards. During his turns, Metaton EX combines all the attacks in his arsenal to make incredibly tricky to dodge attacks. And if these attacks hit, they're going to hurt, as all of Metaton EX's attacks have a base damage of either 6 or 7, the highest we've seen so far. You see this ratings meter over here? It starts at about 4,000, and it rapidly goes down during your turn. Your goal is to get it over 10,000 in order to end the fight. This may sound sound like a tough task, but it really isn't that bad, as almost everything you do in this fight affects the ratings, and most of them will cause them to go up. 
You can also use acts such as heal turn and boast to increase the rating. Boast can be especially useful because it causes ratings to go up during Metaton's turn until you get hit. And since Metatons are attacks are on a cycle, if you know an easy attack is coming up, you can get a ton of ratings for little effort. Overall, Metaton EX ranks as one of Undertale's hardest bosses due to how he combines his vast arsenal into hard to dodge attacks that do a lot of damage when hit. Number 4, Asgore. The boss fight with the King of the Monsters is definitely one that is very well built up throughout the entire game. On your journey through the underground, various characters talk to you about Asgore, and you learn his story and why he does the things he does during the game. And while on every route you only meet him near the end, his presence and the inevitability of the fight with him are felt through basically the entire game. And why wouldn't it be, as Asgore is basically the reason why your journey through the underground is so dangerous in the first place. He's the one who declared war on humanity after his children died, and he even killed the children who fell into the underground before you. The souls of these dead children would go on to possess the animatronics of the pizzeria, due to their bodies being stuffed inside them. This is the reason why the animatronics will attack and kill you if they manage to get into your office- uh, uh, oh, sorry, my mistake. Wrong indie game hit. Compared to Metaton, Asgore has a smaller, though no less deadly, arsenal of attacks that mainly can consists of fire magic. His attacks include moving his hands across the screen to create lines of fireballs that shoot towards you, waves of fireballs that fall in a double helix pattern, small waves of fireballs that are accompanied by large fire pillars, a barrage of large fireballs that come from the top of a screen, and making you fall into a burning, burning ring of fire. You I went down, 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 but the flames get higher. He will also slash at you with his trident. The attack will either be blue, which can't hurt you while you don't move, or orange, which can't hurt you while you move. You can tell whether it's going to be blue or orange based on the way his eyes flash before he uses the attack, but it can still be a bit tricky due to how quick the next slash comes out after the previous one. And the slashes, along with the rest of his attacks, become faster as his HP gets lower. As well, all of Asgore's attacks have a base damage of either 6 or 8, meaning even with the game's stronger armors, it's still going to hurt if you get hit. A nice touch in this fight is that if you get hit by one of Asgore's attacks without enough HP to survive, then it'll reduce reduce you to 1 HP instead of killing you. It's a nice little way to show how Asgore really doesn't want to kill you, but feels like he has to. You can also lower Asgore's attack by either eating the butterscotch pie or using the talk act three times. Both of these actions will also reduce Asgore's defense. This wouldn't matter in basically any other fight on the pacifist route, but it does matter here because Asgore is one of the few bosses in the game you're forced to use the fight option on. Asgore is pretty beefy and can take a lot of hits, having three fast 1,500 HP, so you're gonna have to be dealing with his attacks for quite a bit before you can actually take him down. Overall, Asgore's attacks are high damaging and can be quite hard to dodge, especially later in the fight when they speed up. That, combined with the high amount of hits he can endure, is what places Asgore just outside the top three hardest bosses in Undertale. Number three, Photoshop Flowey. In a game full of unforgettable moments, reopening your game after Flowey causes it to crash only to be met with this monstrosity is probably one of the most memorable. I mean, what must Toby Fox have been on to think? Dude, you know this, uh, this pixel RPG combat game that's turn-based? Let's make a fight where we just throw the turn system out and the boss just constantly throws shit at you. Oh yeah, and instead of being, like, pixelated, it's gonna be an abomination I made by throwing a ton 
ton of different stuff together into Photoshop. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a plant, too. The answer to that question? Some really good shit. In this fight, Flowey alternates between bombarding you with his own attacks and sicking the human souls he has under his command on you. When he's attacking, Flowey bombards you with bullets fired from his eyes, flamethrowers, circles of quote-unquote friendliness pellets, barrages of vines, and a long dead meme. I'm a fire in my labor! You can also attack with swarms of flies, conducting bombing raids, using finger guns, and summoning three snake mouth things that ricochet off the walls. They're referred to as dentata in the files, and before you even think about it, no. Do not look it up. You do not want to know what a dentata is. Due to now having more determination and power than you, Flowey is now able to use the save and load feature, and he uses it during this fight. He uses it to reverse time to try and bait you into getting hit by an attack you already dodged. Kind of like King Crimson, but in reverse. I already used the clip of you during the Metaton segment. Go away. At certain points in the fight, a siren sounds and a warning screen appears on the TV and you're taken to one of the soul attacks. During the soul attacks, you'll have to deal with spinning knives, spinning circles of gloves, crushing ballerina shoes and stars that limit your movement, uh, negative words? Personally, I would have just stuck to sticks and stones. A frying pan that rains down fire on you. And lastly, a gun. During these sections, what you have to do is wait for the act button to show up and use it to cry out for help, which causes the soul to start resisting Flowey and weaken him. The soul will also turn all of their attacks into healing, and you'll likely be able to heal back to full after each soul attack. After you free all the souls, you enter the final phase where Flowey's defense drops to zero and you can finally start doing some real damage when the fight button appears. Now after you get Flowey's HP to zero, you're finally at the end of this long fight. God damn it! After Flowey reloads the file, the souls retaliate and defeat him. Chase the rainbow, motherfucker! Then you're given the choice to either kill or spare him. Photoshop Flowey is definitely the closest Undertale gets to his bullet hell inspirations, with many hard to dodge attacks that cover the screen in projectiles. Not only do a lot of Flowey's attacks leave very little room to move, but a few of them, particularly the vines and the flamethrowers, have long lasting hitboxes that make them hard to dodge. Another reason Photoshop Flowey is difficult is because his attacks are relentless, with very little to no downtime between them. The only real exception to this being the transitions between the soul attacks, and for 60 seconds, Flowey's eye beams are slowed down at the beginning of the final phase. As well, this is quite the long fight as you have to free six different souls, all while surviving Flowey's onslaught in between. One thing that lowers Flowey's difficulty is that you don't have to do it all in one go, as the game remembers which souls you freed even after you die, so you don't lose progress. However, that doesn't change the fact that you're still probably gonna die a lot, and considering that causes the game to crash in this fight, your Steam friend toast notifications are probably going to look a little something like this. What is this dumbass doing? As terrifying as Flowey is when he's hopped up on the power of six human souls, he's only the second most intimidating plant I've ever seen. The first is ragweed during the allergy season. No, seriously. Thanksgiving turkeys wish they were half as stuffed as my nose when the pollen is let loose. Number two, Undyne v Undying. This fight is what happens when you take the normal Undyne fight and put it on dope, speed, crack, and every performance enhancer known to man. In this fight, you alternate between using two different soul modes, green and red. It's kind of like Christmas, but if you replace Christmas cheer with Christmas spear and getting presents with getting pail. Starting off with the green mode, in comparison to the normal Undyne fight, the arrows are now much faster and come in much harder patterns. And she uses the yellow arrows a lot more, too. It's not just the fast arrows that are a problem, too, as some patterns involve throwing tons of slow-moving arrows at you, and it can be quite tricky to block all of them. During the Red Soul phase of this fight, Undyne will use buff versions of the Red Soul Spear attacks she used in her original fight. These versions of the attacks throw more speeds at you and have an increased speed. As well, she has two new attacks in this fight that involve rings of spears that enclose in on you. One version has them rotate 
and the other doesn't. Not only are Undyne V and Dying's attacks hard to dodge, but if you get hit, they are gonna hurt, as they have a base damage of 8 and 12. Undyne's attack power combined with the difficulty in dodging her attacks can cause the damage to add up quite quickly, even with the 60 HP you have at this point in the genocide route. Not only is Undyne able to dish out damage in this fight, but she can take it too with her 23,000 HP total. Yeah, they don't call her Undyne the Undying for nothing, do they? I guess I really didn't have that much to say about Undyne the Undying since she's mostly just the original Undyne fight but with a new coat of paint. A very, very painful coat of paint. But hey, I'm trying, and failing, to not make this video too long, and the Omega Flowey segment was approaching five minutes. So I'm glad I was able to say all I wanted to say here relatively quickly. And here we are, top billing, numero uno, the number one hardest boss in Undertale is set- Metaton Neo, baby, oh yeah! Phew. Barely made it out alive, truly the hardest boss ever made. The real number one, Sans the Skeleton. After going through New Home on the Genocide Route and obtaining the real knife and the locket, most players were probably wondering how anything could be a cha- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Sans's first attack comes out before your turn starts, and he's the only enemy in the game to be able to do this, so it'll definitely catch players off guard if they don't already know it's coming. As well, the first time you die and retry on this fight, he'll interrupt his opening dialogue to sucker punch you with it again. That should give you a pretty good idea of how the rest of this fight is gonna play out. But anyway, as I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, most players were probably wondering how anything could be a challenge after having obtained a real knife and the locket, both of which give a 99 point boost in attack and defense respectively. The answer to this question is pretty simple, a boss that makes both stats completely useless. You see, when you look at Sans's stats at first, you aren't likely to be impressed considering he has one defense, one attack, and one HP. Sans would probably die if he accidentally stubbed his toe, so how does he even last one turn against you, let alone be unquestionably the hardest boss in the game? Game? Well, the answer's pretty simple. He's a damn ninja. Every time you try to land a hit on Sans, he will dodge your attack without fail. As he dodges, however, he gets more and more tired until he's forced to bring out his special attack. More on that later. One thing that's important to note is that doing any action other than fighting, such as, say, using a healing item on your turn, will not progress the fight. As for Sans only having one attack, well, it's exactly as it says on the tin. Getting hit by Sans' attack does one damage. That is one damage for every frame you're touching the attack. But, but I'm, I'm not, not done yet. yet. Not only do you not have invincibility frames in this fight, but all of Sans's attacks have this little thing called karma. And as the age old saying goes, karma is a bitch. You see, when you get hit by one of Sans's attacks, not only do you take one damage per frame, but it also builds up your karma meter. This karma meter then slowly goes down by about one every second, taking your HP with it. And different attacks increase karma by different amounts. To put it simply, it's poison. As such, not only are you likely to take anywhere from 30 to 40 damage from Sans's attacks due to the lack of invincibility frames, but you're also gonna have to deal with karma draining your health too. Not only are Sans's attacks punishing when you get hit, but they're very hard to avoid too. Sans's attacks in this first phase are mainly harder to dodge in faster versions of Papyrus's attacks, as well as some new ones that in addition to employing bones, also make use of platforms and these things called Gaster Blasters, which fire energy beams. In contrast to the bullet hell nature of other fights, Sans's attacks often require difficult platforming in order to dodge them. After trying to attack them enough times, Sans will start to get tired and try offering you mercy. By the way, it's a trap.
During this time, you're free to heal up in preparation for Phase 2, and believe me, you're gonna need it. Sans' attacks in Phase 2 involve him slamming you against the battle board because in addition to being a ninja, he's also a Jedi, and then following it up with a bone stab. Firing Gaster Blasters that will be small and fast the first time he uses the attack, but every time he uses it after that, they're slower but have bigger hitboxes. Randomly cobbled together compilations of mini attacks in hell, he'll even attack you on the menu during your turn. He also has this one bone attack where one side goes up and the other goes down and I have no idea how to dodge it. It's definitely his hardest attack to dodge outside of his final attack. Said final attack, by the way, starts off with slams and bone stabs, and then pits you against falling and rising bones, then having to thread the needle between a long wall of bones, then avoiding more bone obstacles, followed by more bone stabs, all capped off with a ring of gaster blasters. This attack is without question the single hardest one to dodge in the game, and an infuriating amount of my runs ended at the Gaster Blaster Ring. But if you do manage to survive this attack, you've effectively won the fight. Feel accomplished with yourself? Well, congratulations, you missed the entire point of the genocide room. Don't get me wrong, Sans is definitely the hardest boss in Undertale, but I do think people tend to oversell his difficulty a bit. He's very hard, that's for sure, but he's not impossible and there are ways in-game to make the fight easier, such as equipping the pan to make food heal more, or equipping the cloudy glasses or torn notebook to make karma a bit less threatening. As well, not all of Sans' attacks are created equal, and the biggest example of this is probably the slam followed by the bone stab, as all you need to do to avoid it is just hold down all the arrow keys at once. And since Sans' attacks are on a cycle, this can be exploited to get heals in when you know an easy attack is coming. Regardless, Sans is definitely definitely the hardest boss in Undertale, and if you try to beat him, there's no question you're going to die a ton. A skeleton? What? It's the sand segment. Did you think I was not gonna make a pun? And with that, we have reached the end of the Undertale boss ranking, and holy shit, it's over an hour long. It's safe to say that I absolutely suck at keeping my videos a reasonable length, huh? And to think, I get videos approaching the one hour mark from games that have around only 20 bosses. I can only imagine how bad the issue would be on a video about something like Hollow Knight or Dark Souls 2, both of which have over 40 bosses. And I don't even want to think about what an Elden Ring ranking would look like. Hopefully the next few rankings I have planned will be easier to get a reasonable length for, as Undermine doesn't really have that many bosses, and a Minecraft Dungeons update changed what qualifies for a boss in that game, which lowered the overall boss count. Anyway, now's usually when I give my thoughts on the game I've done a ranking on, but honestly, what's there to say about Undertale that hasn't already been said? It's great, its writing is phenomenal, its characters are likable, and it's a very interesting meta-narrative on games as a whole. As well, if Undertale wasn't made, then indie games may never have gotten as big as they are today, which would have robbed us of a lot of great times. Times. Do I think it's the greatest game ever made? No, there's certainly criticisms to be had, and there's other games where I've just simply had more fun. Regardless, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't up there, and I can definitely see why somebody else would call it their favorite. As well, it's definitely one of the most unforgettable games of all time, with tons of memorable moments that will be sticking with me and many others for a long time. But anyway, this video is getting way too long, so let's just wrap it up here. If if you enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, and if you enjoy the rest of the content on my channel, why not subscribe and ring the notification bell? And before I leave, remember, Sans Undertale is the sexiest man alive, no seriously, there was a vote, and see you in the next video.